Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 98 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. And before we get to this week's guest, Chad Brandolini, the director of artist relations from Vader Percussion, and Mike Wengren, the drummer from Disturbed, I wanted to put a quick plug in for the Mistress Carrie backstage pass on Patreon. If you're looking for a little bit more Mistress Carrie, getting a backstage pass on Patreon is the way to go. You get access to exclusive monthly live streams, discount codes in the online Mistress Carrie store, which, by the way, will have new tank tops in it by the end of the week. You get travel blogs and photographs. You can even submit questions for upcoming podcast interviews. And you get access to exclusive concert ticket giveaways. So if you're looking for a little more Mistress Carrie in your life, get a Mistress Carrie backstage pass on Patreon. You can click the link in the show notes of this podcast or go to patreon.com slash Mistress Carrie. And I want to say what's up to Crystal, Des, Will, Denise, Monica, John, Brett, Atwood, Ashley, and Tracy, the latest recipients of a Mistress Carrie backstage pass. This week's episode is for the drummers. If you've ever wondered about the design of a drumstick and what goes into it and how an artist designs their own drumstick, well, this episode is for you. I sat down with Chad Brandolini, the Director of Artist Relations at Vader Percussion. His job is to work with artists themselves to figure out the exact drumstick and percussion mallet and tools and accessories that they need to take their drumming to the next level. He works to perfect their signature drumsticks and accessories. We also talked about the history of Vader Percussion, the different wood styles that get used, what's required from Vader to make sure that the artists are happy while they're out on the road. And he even suggested that we talk to a Vader artist, which is how Mikey Wengren from Disturbed ended up chiming in about halfway through this week's episode. And we were able to talk to him about designing his unique style. We also talked about his drum techniques, his influences, and so much more. And this episode made for a fantastic corresponding playlist, which I put together for every full-length episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast. I was so excited that Chad said yes when I asked him about this interview. I've known Chad and the people at Vader Percussion for a really long time. They even sponsored my trips overseas in 2006 to Iraq and 2011 to Afghanistan. So we go way back. So allow me to introduce you to Chad Brandolini from Vader Percussion and Mike Wengren from Disturbed. Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Food Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to... You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Mr. Brandolini. Cheers. We're both having, Hello. We're both having coffee, so cheers. Get the coffee. Get the mm. black coffee going. It's like the eighth one of the day. Do you really like work that. in the Who's music counting? industry if you don't drink coffee constantly? I don't think so. No, it's definitely a uh, full-time requirement yeah. all day. Coffee. It's good to see you. Same here. It's been uh, it's been way too long for sure. You I, are... I can't remember the last time yeah. we ran into each other at a show or somewhere out and about. You're somebody that I see so often because we're just constantly at concerts, or we used to before COVID, and. I tried when when you agreed to do this interview, which, by the way, thank you very much. 
Well, um, thank you for having me. I tried to remember when we met, and I I feel like you're somebody that I've always kind of known, but I can't remember exactly when we met the first time. Yeah, you know, I was actually kind of thinking the same thing, and I don't know if it's a hundred percent accurate, but like I, one of the earlier times I remember is when Seven Dust was out doing the promo stuff for the home record. Oh yeah, and it was, it was probably right around there ish. Which was way longer than I want to admit out loud. Yeah, we don't need to throw specific dates out there and uh, age ourselves here. That was an incredible. (laughs) It's been a while. That was an incredible era. And like previously on the podcast, I had Morgan Rose on the podcast from Seven Dust. And then I had Toby Wright, who produced that record on the podcast, and kind of talking about the experience of working at Longview. And I've talked to so many artists. Um, that have recorded there. Dez from Devil Driver and Cold Chamber recorded there. Um, I think Spencer, I think it was Spencer Charnas from Ice Nine Kills that it's just funny, the artists that have these experiences at that legendary studio, which, you know, is no longer a studio, but um, right. it was cool having that kind of really amazing recording studio local. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no doubt. That was just one of those legendary places. And, you know, unfortunately, like a lot of things in a lot of places like that, you know, it's just kind of no longer. When I started, a, a drag. when I started the Mistress Carrie podcast, it was really important for me to be able to kind of open up the discussion about the music that we all love so much. And so when people ask me to give them the elevator pitch on the podcast, I always say it's a rock lifestyle podcast. So anything that kind of fits under the umbrella, if you love rock music, then it has a place here. And so it's not just about the rock stars, but it's about talking about the people that are behind the actual production of the music, the roadies, the producers, the people that are making the instruments. And because I was born and raised in Massachusetts, I think there's a lot of people that are surprised how many instruments and how many different companies are kind of centered around the Northeast when it comes to the music getting made. Mm-hmm. And Vader yeah. is one of these companies that that's how we know each other. Cause you're a local guy. <laughs> Absolutely. Out and about all the time and talking drumsticks with people and the whole thing. And yeah, it's uh, it, there's a lot of drum industry companies around this area, you know, as, as you know, you know, between us and some of our competitors and cymbal companies and drum companies and, and the whole thing. So yeah, it's uh, definitely a little hot area for, for the drum world. What is it? Is that is it that New Englanders are just so inherently angry that that drumming is something that kind of <laughs> like why is it that we make so much <laughs> loud noise in New England? We all need something to get through these winters and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. You know, it's get sit down in the kit and bash it out and get all that anger out against uh, <laughs> the snowfall and the winter and the cold and the whole thing. Who knows? Um, Do me a favor. Tell me what your exact job description is at Vader Percussion. What is it that you do exactly? uh, (laughs) uh, That's a lot. So uh, I'm the director of artist relations and marketing. uh, And then along with that, there's a lot of other things as far as like product design and work with the factory guys on different things. And, you know, wearing many hats, uh, sourcing products and all that kind of stuff as well. Uh, But, you know, main day to day things are, you know, working directly with the artists and drum techs and tour managers and management companies and all that sort of thing on, uh, you know, the artists that endorse our sticks. For anybody that's not familiar with Vader Percussion as a company, um, can you kind of run down the history of the company and kind of talk about all of the different things that the company manufactures? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, this year, actually, 2022 is the 30th anniversary of the Beta brand, uh, like the proper Beta brand coming out. Uh, but the Vader family has been making drumsticks since the 1950s. Uh, Alan and Ron Vader's grandfather was this guy, Jack Adams, who was a Boston drummer, well-known, had his own music store, uh, and started making drumsticks in the basement of his drum shop back in the day for a lot of legendary players at the time. So like Buddy Rich, Alvin Jones, Philly Joe Jones, like all these guys that were his close friends, you know? So he was doing that for a long time. And then fast forward, uh, Alan and Ron Vader's father opened up their own music shop uh, in the 1970s, like mid 1970s uh, in Norwood. And 
at that time, like, you know, the Vader brothers were working in the store and there was a labor strike at a drumstick company that was manufacturing sticks for drum shops and all that kind of stuff. And they just had the, the idea like, hey, our grandfather used to make drumsticks and all that. How hard could it be? Right. <laughs> so let's let's give it a shot and make some sticks for the store. So they uh, started renting some lathe time up on 128 at a, uh, a wood turning company and all that. So they went in there and, and really dove in and started learning how to do it and coming up with their own thing. And so they made it, started making sticks for the store, uh, which then turned into fast forward a couple of years, uh, Vic Firth from the Vic Firth drumstick company and all that. Yeah, he was a timidus for the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He came into the store, asked where they were getting the sticks from while we're actually making them here in the store. And uh, so then that turned into manufacturing some drumsticks for, for Vic Firth himself, because he, he was making sticks then at the time, but they were just maple sticks. So um, the Vader brothers started making hickory sticks for Vic Firth, and then it spun into uh, designing and manufacturing sticks for Zildjian. And then it turned into other companies like drum companies and all that. And it spiraled into, you know, the mom and pop shops doing their own logoed kind of sticks for stores. Uh, and then fast forward to 1992, the Vader line properly came out and been off and running with the Vader brand ever since. That's kind of like the condensed version of the story. And then you go from just making wooden drumsticks. And when you think about drumming and percussion, in the rock world, we think about the big heavy hitters, right? The guys that are mm -hmm. snapping sticks all the time. But when you're a percussion company, there's also all of these other kinds of things that you manufacture because it's not just rock music that has drummers. Every genre of music all the way to, like you were referring, classical percussionists, timpani players. And so mm -hmm. it's mallets and brushes. I mean, how many different things are you guys making now? Whew. Uh, so drumstick wise, we have over 220 drumstick models. Um, last I did a proper check. Uh, and then it's, you know, dozens of, you know, specialty sticks and brushes and mallets for vibraphone and marimba and xylophone, uh, you know, marching snare drum sticks, accessories like, you know, we do cymbal polishes and drum polishes and stick holders and cymbal bags and practice pads and it's just uh, it's a whole lot, hundreds of, of products and uh, and still more to come. You know, it's there's a lot of uh, modifications you can make into a stick and all that kind of stuff. We'll get into a little bit of that, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, it's constantly evolving and, you know, keeping up with what the demand is out there in the market and with the players and consumers and the whole thing. So, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot. You know, they started with a handful of of models when the Vader line came out in 92, there was probably eight or 10 models of just drumsticks. And now, like I said, there's over 220 just drumsticks plus all the other stuff. Now I talk to so many drummers and I always make the joke that like, if you're going to be a musically inclined kid, that your parents are secretly hoping that you don't want to play the drums because <laughs> it takes up a so much room and B makes so much noise did you grow up playing the drums? Is that why you have this love of working in the percussion industry? Um, a, a little bit. So I kind of started later, um, maybe like 12 or 13. Uh, you know, my father was a drummer back when he was a kid and his cousin was a drummer. Um, you know, and growing up, like, you know, heard about my dad and, had, you know, played drums and seen some pictures and all that kind of stuff. And then it wasn't really until like middle school where he started playing again and playing in cover bands and gigging around and stuff like that. And the band would rehearse at our house and stuff like that. Um, but then just like always having music on in the house uh, just immediately attracted me to it, you know? So, and then even before just like coming across like drum catalogs and flipping through them and seeing these gigantic drum kits in the late eighties and like, you know, how shiny they were and the whole thing. Drummers you know? with their and, kits uh, on on roller coasters and pyro. And I mean, all that, everything that was all over MTV yeah. and, you know, the whole thing, you know, and just love the vibe of it and the look and just the whole thing. And it it really kind of sucked me in. Um, and then I, for some reason, I started playing guitar. Like, I just thought, like, I'll pick up the guitar. 
Uh, that didn't last long at all. Like a couple of lessons. I was like, eh, it's not for me. Uh, and then just got a drum kit and like, just have been off and running ever since really. How, um, when you're growing up with musicians in the family, I'm a hundred percent convinced a, that it's a genetic thing because it's, it's undeniable with the people that I talk to all the time that, that, you know, there are examples of people that are like, no, there's no musicians in the family, but it's always right. like, oh, you know, my mom was a singer in church or like there's always this thread somewhere of musical ability and and drumming seems like something that would be the hardest thing to really master because like a helicopter pilot, all four of your appendages have to be able to do different things simultaneously. Right. Yeah, it's it definitely is a lot of coordination and just muscle memory and just, you know, the whole thing. Um, you know, I, I only really took a handful of lessons uh, ever. And it was from Dave Desenzo, who we both know. Um, and that was in high school. Um, but, you know, besides that, I always just kind of learned by watching people play and hearing, listening to cassettes and CDs and everything. And just like, well, what are they doing there? Um, you know, fast forward now, like I'm jealous of the, what the kids have now, of you know, watching videos and YouTube stuff, like everything's instant and you can slow down frame by frame and like really dial into, you know, what players are doing. Uh, but then, yeah, it was just a lot of listening and trying to mimic it and, you know, the, and the whole thing like that. And you talk about like practice pads, which for anybody that doesn't know what they are, they're just these little things that you can drum on, but they don't make any noise. So parents yeah. have it better off nowadays too, because there <laughs> are ways to have a kid that's a drummer without getting the massive drum kit in the garage, making all the noise, because there are ways to to learn and practice the drums without waking up the neighborhood. Yep, Absolutely. Yeah, just, you know, from traditional practice pads like that. And then there were some that, you know, we have a whole line of them too that go over the actual acoustic drums, kind of like a mouse pad type material. So that deadens it quite a lot and makes it super quiet. And then right down to, you know, how much electronic drum kits have evolved over the years. Like that's a whole other thing, um, you know, that's great for, you know, people in apartments and houses and don't want to bother the parents and neighbors and the dog and the whole thing. Uh, you know, there's quite a lot of gear out there to, uh, to be able to play drums nowadays without making a whole ton of noise. And I think that electric stuff, I mean, that really came up in like the late seventies and eighties in the pop world. But I think, mm -hmm. I think Rick Allen from Def Leppard kind of out of necessity for obvious reasons showed that, that you can incorporate that kind of newer electronic technology into drumming in the, in a rock way and uh, it saved his career, but also kind of it made it acceptable to have those electronic things in rock and roll, too. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. There were a lot of players, you know, right after that time, started to incorporate all that into into drum kits, you know, and it's you'd be hard pressed to find a show these days where there isn't some sort of electronic element. Uh, along with, you know, the rest of the drum kit up there, whether it's you know, little sampling pads or triggers on drums or you know, whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, it, those two worlds have definitely kind of meshed quite a bit over the years. You talk about like, like a, a Rick Allen from Def Leppard where there's definitely a, a sound change because he needed to be able to kind of redesign his kit. You're an expert in, in the drumming kind of world in general, or at least I'm going to tell you that you are more so than I am. <laughs> But Slow when, down now. <laughs> when you look at, at when you look at like the history of professional drummers and obviously you and I are such huge rock fans. So take me back through modern era drummers and kind of give me some of the milestones and like examples of the evolution of drumming, because you, you like you said, in the 80s with these giant flashy kits but for for people that just love the music that they love there have been lines in the sand where it's like this person changed drumming forever and it's not so much a who's your favorite drummer kind of thing but like there are examples right. when you kind of dig through the soil and look at the history of drumming that like th things just changed because of that person right absolutely yeah i mean you know, going back even, you know, into swing and jazz times and all that stuff, like drummers were, you know, 
they were band leaders, right? And drummers came over their own records. They were the star on the cover of the record, you know, Buddy Rich and Elvin Jones and Lionel Hampton um, was well, like Chico Hamilton and all those kind of guys. Um, you know, they were, they were the artists and they had their backing band and all that. Um, and then obviously it has evolved since, but um, yeah, you look at different time frames, even like, you know, Motown music and all that kind of stuff. And like, you know, the drum kits, in the setup and the tone and all that kind of stuff. Then, you know, some of that stuff has come around full circle again to where everything is, you know, super dry and, you know, tight sounding and the whole thing. Um, yeah. And then, like you said, going into, you know, the eighties and the huge kits and all that stuff. And, you know, the Tommy Lee's all flashy stick twirling, hanging upside down the whole thing. Uh, and then nineties comes along and, you got Dave Grohl up there on a small little kit, just bashing away. Uh, and then even going back a little bit again, like, you know, Stuart Copeland, you know, came out and he had a very distinct sound and started incorporating, you know, little splash cymbals and effect stuff into drumming. And, you know, that had a, a huge influence on tons and tons of players, um, you know, all the way down to, you know, modern day times with, with guys, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm I mean, it is, it is so varied that in rock, you can have a guy playing a simple kit like a Ringo. Yep. And then Mike Mangini. It's yeah. a pretty varied and wide spectrum when it comes to drum kits. Like, like building a, a kit in the studio a few years ago for Mike Mangini out of everything but drums and oh, watching yeah, the, his the bucket kit. And- yeah. And watching <laughs> him be able to, to like play the drums on like suitcases and trash barrel lids and stuff. But especially recently looking at that amazing docu-series about the Beatles and watching mm. like Ringo, like it's almost like he, he, there was no gear there. He had nothing there. And he's just sitting back there like, this is my gig, man. And that's. Yep. Totally. And, and become, you're coming up with super creative parts and all that stuff for that, for that music. And yeah, just out of a four piece little kit, couple of symbols, nothing fancy, uh, you know, little rags on the drums and everything to deaden them up because, you know, all, everything bleeding through the microphones and the whole thing. And they were in that gigantic room. Um, but it just worked, you know, and it, it sounded so great. Um, but yeah, you know, you go to Mangini, it's like, you know, you sit at a kit like that and you step on a pedal over here and somewhere or all the way over here, something goes, it makes a noise, you know, it's just like, it's amazing. And for players like him, it. yeah. And for players like him that can do all that and have all that stuff and fit it all in musically is just absolutely incredible. You know, when you, all good stuff. when you say things and, and, and I want to go over some of the drumming terms because it's your job to work directly with the artist. And so mm-hmm. as a drummer in a, in a band, any, any drummer, it doesn't matter if it's an orchestra or a rock band, whoever it is, that drummer has an idea of what they want to sound like. When I talk to guitar players, they talk about tone. And so Mm -hmm. a drummer has an idea of what they want their drums to sound like. So when you sit down with an artist to talk about working with them on their drumsticks and their, and their mallets and brushes and all of those kinds of things, start that conversation with me and how you go about working with them to go from the sound that they imagine in their head to the actual finished product of how you help make this sound that only they can hear in their head into something that we all hear at the show. Right. Totally. Well, I'll try not to get too nerdy about it. I'll stop you if you get too nerdy. (laughs) So, um, you know, with drumsticks, it's, you know, is very much a feel and weight thing as well as it is a tone, you know? So, um, you know, we, in every drumstick, every tiny little change of like, you know, the tip shape or the taper or the length can totally affect the feel of the stick, even if it's very close to another stick model. So when dealing with artists and stuff, you know, we just got to get a general vibe of, you know, what kind of a feel and, and tone that they're going for. Um, you know, guys will say something like, you know, I want something that's a little more of a forward throw, you know, so that, that kind of would translate into like a little bit of a, a heavier taper. Um, so like that's, you know, this part of the stick up here. 
So the part that it's um, actually making contact with the drum, if you're talking about weight disbursement, what you're saying is they want the end of the stick that actually makes contact with the drum or the cymbal to have the weight on the front. Exactly. Yeah. When you're talking about, uh, you know, a forward throw kind of a thing, like a little more top heavy, some guys will say. So, yeah, well, you know, we can beef up the, you know, the taper there a little bit in small little increments and whatever. Uh, and even, like I said, those smaller increments make up a, a huge difference. Um, and then, you know, tip shapes make a huge difference too. You know, we have a bunch of different tips, like ball tips and acorn tips, oval tips, nylon tips that are the plastic ones. You know, so you can sit down at the same drum kit with a handful of different sticks and play that kit with that variety of sticks. And every time you pick up a different pair of sticks, it's going to sound, you know, a little bit differently. Um, And then you get into the part of drumstick making where, you know, we're making an instrument out of a natural organic material, right? So wood can, can vary. Um, You know, it it can be heavier, it can be lighter, uh, depending on how much moisture is in the stick, like that can also affect the tone. Uh, You know, if it's super, you know, heavy as far as moisture content, it will have a lower kind of a pitch on, on a drum or on a cymbal. So yeah, all those things kind of come into play. The material that you're talking about when, when you're, when you're making drumsticks out of wood for people that don't play the drums, but maybe, you know, a a carpenter that's listening that works with wood every day, or, you know, somebody that doesn't do anything with wood, but they've sat around a campfire and they throw a log of something on the fire and it burns really fast versus something (laughs) that maybe burns for a lot longer. The type of wood makes a huge difference that some woods are a lot harder and more dense. Some woods Mm -hmm. are softer with more moisture, like you're talking about. Give me some examples of the types of woods that we're talking about and how that wood, just the actual tree itself, what those changes are. Absolutely. So like about 85% of the sticks that we make are out of hickory. Uh, And that's because it's super durable and it absorbs shock quite a bit. So, you know, you got a drummer up there hitting a bunch of metal stuff with a piece of wood, you know, so there's a lot of vibration. There's a lot of force that goes into playing, um, you know, some with heavier hitting styles more so than others like that comes into play a lot, too. So, you know, hickory, they use hickory for axe handles and hammer handles and stuff like that because of that, because it absorbs a lot of shock. So um, and then it's very durable. So a hickory stick will will slowly chip away like that uh, over time. And then maple, we also make sticks out of maple as well. And that's a lot lighter. It's a softer wood. Um, It's a lower kind of pitch, a little more subtle, um, you know, as far as tone and all that kind of stuff goes, but it's not as, it's still durable, but it wears differently. Um, Maple will kind of dent up and and ding and won't won't like fray and chip away like a hickory stick does. So when a maple sticks lifetime is up, like it just like, pow, it goes, you know, um, whereas a hickory stick, like most of the time you can feel it and the stick starts to feel, you know, kind of dead in your hand or whatever, um, less it, rebound. It lets the whole you thing. know so that it's then, going. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, whereas yeah, maple, you know, you'd be sitting there with nothing left besides what's in your hand sometimes, uh, because yeah, we'll just go and, and that's it. Time for another one. So for somebody like me that doesn't know a lot about wood, I've heard that like mahogany and that kind of stuff is a lot more dense. Why not make sticks out of that? Uh, Kind of a good question. (laughs) (laughs) That too, availability and expense and all that stuff. But, you know, back to the hickory thing, because like I said, we do make about 85% of our drumsticks out of hickory. Uh, It just has a really great feel, you know? So, uh, again, that's one of the main concerns for a drummer is how the stick feels in the hand. So um, with the shock absorption and how it rebounds off of a drum or a cymbal, stuff like that, the durability factor, um, and then availability. Hickory grows all over the United States. Um, You know, it's available, you know, pretty rarely. So it's it's always been kind of like the go-to wood. You know, we have some competitors that make some sticks out of Japanese oak. Um, and that's a lot heavier and like super heavy. 
Um, but turning drumsticks on a lathe out of oak, um, it does a number on the tooling and the knives and, and all that kind of stuff because it's so dense. Um, you know, we used to make a handful of models out of oak, but backed away from it um, quite a few years ago because of that. But um, yeah, I mean, primarily hickory and maple are the go-tos. So I want to go through the, the evolutionary process of the stick. So obviously the first step in the process is the actual tree. And so for yeah. a company like Vader, you kind of got to be in the tree business. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. You know, so we've we've had a lot of the same wood suppliers for decades. You know, we work very closely with them. Alan Vader works with them on a daily basis. Um, and so they go out, they harvest the wood, they, they plank it, they dowel it, they dry it, uh, and the whole thing all to our specs. So when we get the the wood in, you know, thousands of dowels on a pallet, uh, you know, we'll go through with moisture reading, you know, tools and all that kind of stuff and make sure it's within a parameter of 10 to 12%, slightly higher moisture content. So we have the durability in there. Uh, so yeah, we get the, the material in as dowels, different lengths and diameters, depending on the model, uh, you know, because we got super skinny sticks, super big sticks, super long sticks. So you need different material looking in, right? So it all comes in. We throw it through the lathe. Uh, that's a whole other thing to talk about as far as the manufacturing process. Um, but yeah, the hickory and the maple come in as as dowels, pretty much ready ready to be turned on the lathe in our uh, our factory. So with two hundred and twenty different models that you guys have now. You've got all of these different artists that have their signature line and you work with these yeah. artists and they say, okay, I want this to be top heavy. I want the diameter of the stick to be smaller or bigger. And at the end of the day, they've got to hold these things in their hands for hours and hours and hours every day. And if you've ever met a drummer, it's like meeting a ballerina and looking at their feet. Their hands <laughs> yep. are just destroyed from the abuse of it. Um, Making these sticks sound good and feel good is this delicate balance, right? Of like, you want the drummer to be comfortable, but you can't give away the sound of it for pure comfort. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that can be, you know, kind of tricky when, when designing a, a signature product like that, you know, and, and trying to really narrow down what is in the player's mind as far as what, what they're trying to get out of the stick in their hands and how they're explaining the feel and, and the tone that they're looking for and the whole thing. So, um, you know, sometimes it goes pretty quickly and we can prototype something once or twice and, and nail it. Uh, sometimes it's a lengthier process, you know, and, but when we're doing a signature stick uh, designed for an artist like that, you know, end of the day, we want it to be a hundred percent on for, for the artist, you know, like, cause they're the ones using it every night on stage in front of, you know, whether it's 40 people or 40,000 people, you know? So, um, so it's, it's the first, first connection to their instrument is their sticks, you know? So we want to make sure that it's a hundred percent spot on for them. Uh, so yeah, we go through the whole design process. Uh, sometimes we had, we got to order, you know, new tooling for the lathes and all that stuff, uh, which is a whole other thing, but um, yeah, it's, it's quite an evolved process for sure. And like I said, prototyping things. And then some guys like, uh, you know, sticks without finish on them or getting into, you know, some colored sticks and stuff like that. Like, you know, painted sticks, you know, like these ones we just did for Chad Smith, um, for the Eddie Vedder tour that he did where the whole thing was, um, the whole stage was all silver and his kit was silver and the symbols and all that stuff. So, we did some custom run sticks for Chad, Chad Smith from silver. the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but he's also the drummer for the Earthlings. That is Eddie Vedder's kind of must be nice to be a guy. It's like, I'm just yep. going to put this little side band together with guys like Chad Smith. No big deal. Yeah. Uh, all good. Yeah. Uh, a couple of, a couple of got well-known guys. They you look know, cool. Silver like that. Coming up in the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and, and that was cool, you know, in doing that with Chad, like and that was a, a thing that was just, you know, because of the times and COVID stuff and, and the whole thing of like just having the verbal explanation of everything's going to be silver, kind of like stainless steel appliances. Like, all right, so now we have to find a paint that's going to, you know, give that look, 
uh, that can adhere to the wood well and not chip away super quick and make a mess everywhere and also still feel natural in the hands and the whole thing. So um, luckily that came together pretty quickly and, uh, and we nailed it pretty much right away with the, um, the particular paint that we found that worked out really well. I would assume that working with varied artists the way that you do, that you have gotten some crazy requests that it's taken some brain power to kind of give <laughs> them what they want. Can you give me some examples of some artists that have said, can you have it do this? And it took you guys a minute to go, how are we going to figure that out? Like something as simple as coloring the drumstick silver. There is a lot of thought. Can you give me some other examples that are like that? There is. Yeah. Um, geez, well, going back in the day, um, you know, we brought on David Silvera from Corn, And um, so he came on board in like 1999-ish or whatever. And, um, and we started designing some custom sticks for him when he was out on the road. And, you know, obviously super aggressive music, hard, heavy, like, you know, David's throwing down the whole thing. And we were customizing some sticks for him. And he was like, it was based on our nice stick model. So, which is already a big stick anyway. So then he wanted the taper, the top end of the stick to be a lot bigger. Again, like back to that forward throw thing. Um, but, you know, the stick got so crazy and so heavy, just like, I couldn't even believe that he was even using it on the road. And like, <laughs> you know, he must have been going through so many symbols at that time and everything, just crushing everything. Um, but yeah, that was one of those things like, uh, we can't make it that much heavier. Like we're, we're already... You're like going to be playing the, boundaries the drums of the with baseball bats and, if you're not careful. <laughs> yeah, it was significantly bigger at the top of the stick than it was in the grip of the stick. Um, so, yeah, it, like stuff like that comes up. Um, and then on the more playable side, like Mike Mangini's stick is similar to that where the stick gets bigger, you know, towards the top of the stick. And going through that whole thing with him was interesting. You know, we had him in the factory and all that coming up with the, the new stick that he wanted to do. And he kept saying like, I want more, more throw, more, more weight towards the front. So uh, yeah, going through that process with him was cool. And then coming up with, we did a couple of prototypes or whatever and, and ended up nailing it to what is now called the wicked piston, uh, which, so it's a totally unique, you know, feel and, and vibe to the whole thing. I have one of them right the here. The stick he sent being, me some. There you go. Yeah. That's it. So, yeah. Um, but besides like that kind of stuff, there hasn't been anything that's been too far out. Um, you know, like whatever somebody comes up with as far as an idea or a finish or, you know, anything like that, you know, we'll dive in and, and go for it and, and really try to make it happen, you know. So you get them designed, you get all these dowels from the actual um, tree guys. <laughs> <laughs> the suppliers. Yeah, from a different, yeah. And then you've Somebody. got all of these dowels all stacked up in the factory. And now yeah. it's time to put them on the lathe, which is the thing that spins it around really fast and actually cuts it into the shape. Yeah. So very old school kind of a process, you know, like setting up a lathe is, is very time consuming and, and very hands on. So, you know, each drumstick uh, size or profile has its own, you know, steel knife and, uh, and other blades that cut the stick. So it will come down, cut the stick in one pass. So it's it's nice and consistent, nice clean cut. Um, and the dowel spinning at, I don't even know how many revolutions per minute, but it's fast. Um, and then it will go through the sanding process um, to you know smooth it all out and then cuts off the little, there's little nubs on either end of the stick to hold it while it's going through the sanding process. So then those get cut off and then it goes into what's kind of just like a, a pencil sharpener type thing, these custom um, machines that we had made to where the stick goes in and will shape the, the tip of the stick. So, and then in that machine, you know, each tip shape and size is different. So we have different tooling for each one of those variations. Uh, and then they go through the finishing process where they get the lacquer and the seal coat applied. And then they go through the whole custom, um, quality control section in the factory where they get rolled twice uh, and then they get stamped with the, the logo designation on them and then pitch paired, weight paired, sleeved up, packaged in bricks of 12 pairs in, um, you know, like a shrink wrap 
and they're shipped out all over the place. And you're not just so making sticks very... for the artists themselves. Like when you talk about Mike Mangini's custom sticks, you're obviously making sticks for Mike Mangini, but you're also allowing people that are fans of Mike Mangini that want to have that same forward throw that they want to play his sticks. So these bricks of sticks that you're talking about, the Mangini sticks aren't just going to Mangini. They're going to, to music stores all over the place. All over the world. Yeah. So everything, you know, whether it's to the artist or to retailers or distributors, all comes out of our one facility. You know, our, our factory and our warehouse is in one building. Everything's made there 100 percent. All the drumsticks, you know, we get the material in, we make it all there. It's all quality controlled there, packaged and shipped right out from there. So, um, yeah, so whether it's going to an artist on, on the road or to a music store and all that kind of stuff, it goes through the same identical production process and quality control care and packaging process and, and the whole thing. Let's, um, let's give some bragging rights to some of the artists that you work with. Uh, tell me... What artist breaks the most sticks that you have to send the most sticks to when they're out on the road? <laughs> uh, one of the guys that always comes to mind uh, like that is Morgan Rose, again, because his style, hard and heavy. Um, so he goes through quite a bit. Uh, you know, Chad Smith, when he's on tour, um, not because he's breaking them. He just likes for most people in the audience to have a souvenir. So he'll, he'll check a lot out. Um, so I was going to ask guys, you that, like, like, does it bum you out a to see a guy breaking sticks because you guys spent so much time crafting them <laughs> and then be at the, everybody that's ever been to a rock show at the end when the band's done and they go out to like, thank the crowd for coming. The drummer's just always throwing sticks everywhere. And it's like, <laughs> what are you doing? We worked so hard to make those for you. <laughs> Right. Yeah. It definitely, uh, it definitely can hit you every once in a while. Like, Hey, slow down there, you know? And I give Morgan a lot of crap about that all the time because, you know, <laughs> him and Vinny like to, to play catch with sticks on stage and the whole thing. And, you know, the next thing you know, sticks are going in and out of the audience and being thrown back and forth and like, get those back in the bag, you know? <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, I mean, again, depending on style and the whole thing and, you know, players techniques and setups, like, you know, drummers go through, it's a wide range. You get guys that will go through a brick or two, a brick is 12 pairs. Um, we'll, we'll have guys that go through a brick a year, you know, and then you got, you know, some of the bigger rock arena things, you know, acts on the road, you know, Guns N' Roses and Poison and stuff like that, where, you know, they need to stock up quite a bit because of their playing style and they go through more pairs and, you know, it's not unheard of to send out, you know, a couple hundred pairs to, to a guy at a time, you know, like a Roy Mayorga or Chad Smith or Morgan Rose or any of those kind of guys, Jay Weinberg from Slipknot, one of our signature artists. Um, yeah, it, it all kind of depends on their playing style and technique and how hard they're hitting and, and the whole vibe and how generous they're feeling at the end of the night. Uh, like we said about as far as giving out, you know, souvenirs to everybody. So are the yeah, Weinbergs it's... the first father son pair that you had? Because Jay Weinberg from Slipknot is Max mm -hmm. Weinberg that played the drums for Conan, but obviously plays with Springsteen. Like, is that the first father son drumming pair that you've worked with? Uh, as far as it, yeah, varied, official... varied playing styles. Right. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. As far as the official artists go. Yeah, definitely. You know, Max and, Max and Jay, um, you know, Max actually brought Jay over to me at a NAM show years and years and years ago before Max was even on board with us. He was like, you know, this is my son, Jay. He loves your sticks. He plays them all the time. Just wanted to make a connection here. And, uh, and we brought Jay on then, you know, a long time ago. Uh, and then fast forward some years, uh, a couple of years later, you know, Max came on officially and all that stuff too. And yeah, it's so great to, to have, you know, artists like that, you know, family guys, two completely different playing styles and the whole thing and, uh, and have them, you know, both on the Vader team is, is really cool. Who's the drummer that you've seen chuck a stick into the audience the furthest? Whew. Because they get tossed out there. Like some of they these do. guys should end up being in the NFL. Like these are Brady level <laughs> passes. <laughs> yeah. Um, geez. I, I'm going to have to probably go Chad Smith on that. You know, he, he gets, uh, gets it moving pretty, pretty well. 
So yeah, he can he can hit towards the back of the arena there. A good good old solid fling, you know. And that's a guy that just like the Weinbergs, like musical ability running in the family. Chad Smith's daughter was on American Idol the other night. It's like what? Yeah, incredible, right? Unbelievable. Yeah. Totally awesome. Um, so, let's let's talk about models that have been incredibly successful because obviously if you've got hundreds of different models um you're making them in varied amounts based on obviously how many sticks the artist themselves goes through but also as consumers as just regular weekend players or local band musicians Mm -hmm. do you know what the the biggest most successful stick you've ever made is and who gets the bragging rights for that Ah, well, it, it comes down to, you know, the biggest top selling sticks are the core kind of models that have been around forever. Oh, so okay. it's, it's, you know, the 5A, 7A um, a stick that we came up with called the Fusion, which is in between those two. Uh, that stick came out in what, 94 ish or something like that. And these are uh, Vader sticks that aren't tied to a specific artist design. They're just, they're sticks that Vader kind of has that Exactly. Yeah, they're, they're part specific. of our regular drumstick gotcha. line. Yeah, they're not a they're not signature models with gotcha. an artist name. So yeah, five A, seven A, five B, two B, rock. Um, pretty much, you know, straight ahead standard kind of sizes. Um, and then some of our other top selling models, if you want to talk signature sticks, now are like the Stuart Copeland from the police. Like his stick sells huge for us. Uh Elise Tro, who we came out with a stick for her last year is right up in our top, top top 10 selling sticks now. Uh, Jay Weinberg stick, Chad Smith's, um, Josh Fries. Um, so yeah, you know, it's the core models that are always going to sell really well because they're familiar to drummers, you know, whether you, you go from brand to brand or whatever, like a 5A is going to feel like a 5A, like the player is going to have that reference point, you know? So those are going to be the top selling sticks for sure. You talk about, having a female signature series and this comes up in the podcast a lot luckily as a woman that's been in the rock world for a long time women's role in rock has evolved and become more commonplace and less of a novelty than ever before Mm -hmm. and that that goes with drummers as well are you seeing more girls as children learning to play the drums because they're seeing more examples of female drummers out there in the world? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we started to see that quite a few years ago. Um, and then we were one of the first people on board with um, this. It's called Hit Like a Girl contest uh, that Drum Magazine put out and all that, uh, you know, to push that whole initiative and inspire more young female players to play and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, we've seen, you know, a a huge growth in, you know, the female market and have quite a few artists on board. Um, You know, Cora Coleman, who's got a signature model with us. And, you know, like I said, Elise Tro has got one. And we we have dozens and dozens and dozens of of female artists on the the roster. And they're all out there kicking ass, doing really well. And, uh, And it's awesome to see, you know, and it continues to grow for sure. It is really amazing that... You know, I think I was talking to Lilith Czar or somebody about it that like, you know, it used to be like every once in a while you would bump into a girl and most of the time she would be the singer. And -hmm. then it was like, oh, well, there may be the girl, you know, like White Zombie, the the girl, the, the bass player was a girl or whatever. But now it's so commonplace that women have roles in rock bands and it doesn't automatically get that kind of rubber stamp of, oh, it's a girl band or whatever. Like it really has made these amazing strides over the years. Absolutely. Yeah. And you, you just brought up Lilith, um, you know, her drummer is a beta artist as well, Lindsay Martin. Uh, and then you got the girls in plush that are out there kicking ass and just, you know, they saw, just got off the road with Slash, Slash and all that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and they're doing great. And Brooke is, is a beta artist and she's on Late Night with Seth Meyers all this week as the guest drummer. Um, so just seeing all that stuff, you know, continue to, you know, ignite and keep going is, is awesome for sure. When it comes to the music industry, the entertainment industry in general and COVID, um, hmm. different industries have been affected in different ways. And there were reports coming out that the guitar industry was selling so many guitars through COVID because people were stuck at home. How did it affect 
the drumming world? How did it affect Vader? Were, were more people trying to dig those old drum sets out that they had? Uh, it kind of depends on, on where. Yeah. So, um, you know, overseas and everything, it, it definitely slowed down quite a bit. Um, you know, because a lot more apartment style living and flats and stuff like that, where again, drums are noisy and, you know, it can't be played everywhere. So, you know, I had a lot more people just practicing at home on practice pads and stuff like that. Uh, but it's definitely turning around now, you know, um, you know, and stuff that, you know, touring world and all that obviously came to a, a complete stop. And a lot of people don't realize like how many people that affects just for one band, you know, you oh, have yeah. carpenters out there and catering people and merchandise people, lighting, and sound, managers, truck light, drivers. Yeah. yeah. Venue people are just all, you know, all around. Uh, so yeah, it was a huge, huge drag to, uh, you know, go through all that, but it seems like we're on the other end of it now and there's a lot more shows happening and, all that kind of stuff. So I think we're definitely on a, on a good upswing, but um, yeah, guitar business jumped like crazy. Um, you know, stuff like this, like doing podcasts and interviews and home recording. Like a lot of guys started getting into, you know, doing the home recording thing and, you know, because they were stuck at home and didn't really have the time to do it before. And now they were forced into doing it, you know? So, you know, the segments of that music market definitely grew quite a bit, you know, microphones and cables and, you know, programs and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, drumming is, it's getting stronger. It's coming back, you know, school bands and all that kind of stuff too. You know, all that stuff was super limited and mostly non-existent for a good while, but yeah, all that's picking up quite a bit and everyone needs some sticks now. So we're, uh, we're happy to be doing it. You told me when when we set this interview up that you were going to have a surprise for me, and the surprise I'm going to connect them now. Oh boy! Let me see if we can get his audio working and his video working. Hopefully, he put some pants on. He, he was texting <laughs> me earlier saying he wasn't going to wear any pants, but we'll see. He's trying to connect right now. Hey. Oh my God! It's Mike Wedgren from Disturbed. There we are. How is this thing on? Yes, here it's we on. are. Where are you? I'm uh, just trying to figure this thing out. <laughs> Don't make me make a drummer joke, Mike. Oh! <laughs> Don't make me count past four. <laughs> how how are we doing? Is this thing okay? We, yeah, we guys? can hear you, but we can't see you. Oh, okay. Are you supposed to see me? Um, if you want us to. I mean, like Chad said, he hopes you're wearing pants. Well, I'm definitely not wearing pants. Oh, well, then you may want to keep your camera <laughs> I off. I told those were optional. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I set this interview up with Chad, he was like, I want to get one of the guys on for one of the signature sticks that we have. And I am so excited that it's you. How are you? I was probably the only one that actually answered Chad's text. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I was the first choice. Uh, come on, don't sell yourself short, Mike. No, <laughs> I'm doing great. How about you guys? We're good. Doing all right. For anybody that doesn't know who Mikey Wengren is, you are the drummer in Disturbed. So thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's good to talk to you guys. It's been a while. We've been kind of nerding out a little bit when it comes to drumstick production, but um, for like maybe the one person listening to my show that may not know who you are, can we go back a little bit and talk about um, growing up and when you started playing the drums? Wait, you actually think I grew up? <laughs> I didn't think that was part of the interview. <laughs> No, you know, um, yeah, I, it's a typical cliche sounding story. I was tapping on mom's pots and pans when I was a little kid and um, came from a South Side Chicago family, hardworking class family, couldn't afford drums. So I wasn't able to really start uh, taking lessons or playing until I was old enough to get a part time job and, uh, and buy them myself. So it wasn't until I was like high school age, 15 years old, roughly, get a part-time job working after school, saving up some money, and then I could start uh, actually doing some real playing. Chad and I were talking about how musical ability kind of runs in the family, and he comes from a drumming family. Is that the case with you? 
No, not really. Um, my, my, my mom actually played accordion when she went away when we were young. And my father played uh, just acoustic guitar. But uh, once we got older, they, they, they didn't really continue. So, no, I don't really have much of a musical family. Um, hey, I don't downplay the, the accordion and the influence of the accordion, Mike. <laughs> you can hook that thing up to a distortion pedal. Weird Al is going out on the road this year. He's been making it cool for a long time. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> um, he, he, can, he can own that. He can stick with that. I, I, won't, I won't take his vibe. Did you have the experience when you decided to get that part-time job? Did your parents just go, oh, please don't play the drums? Like, were, were they those parents because of the noise? <laughs> I almost think that that was part of the motivation. They were like, okay, we're going to call your bluff. If you really want to do it and make that noise in the house, then you got to get your ass out there and earn it. So, no, once once I started playing, they were actually really supportive. Um you know, I was limited at, as to when I could play and for how long, you know, because obviously it is loud. But uh, no, they, they, were, they were pretty incredibly supportive. They were my biggest fans early on. I'm shocked that Vader has never come out with a collection of the best wooden spoons for the little kid drummers playing pots and pans. Like, come on, you guys got to do that as a joke. <laughs> that's actually that would be that's, awesome. that's a great idea. I'm a There's marketing a genius. <laughs> well, now we're going to do it. We're going to make them purple. Yes. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Can we keep a disclaimer on that, though, that they're only used for um, like musical production of some kind and not as a weapon to scold your children? <laughs> <laughs> That they're for that's to me. That's why I said that. My, my, mom, my mom broke many a wooden spoons on my behind when I was growing up. Oh, man. <laughs> Well, we've been talking to metal spoons. That's a whole other story. <laughs> whole other story. Um, we were, we've been spending a lot of time talking about signature sticks and they're very collectible. Not that many were made. Mikey, I know you have signature sticks from Vader. You may not know that I have my own line of signature sticks that is called <laughs> the bitch that you guys made that for me. That is awesome. Ago. They are very cool. I don't even play the drums, but am I the only non-drummer that has a signature line of drumsticks at Vader? Those go back quite a ways, too. Yes, they do. That is so cool. How do I get me a pair of those signed? I will save them for you if I can get some of your <laughs> sticks signed in return. Oh, yeah, okay, no problem. Easy. <laughs> don't we have some already? <laughs> Uh, I, I may have picked one up after we, we've been talking about a lot of broken sticks. So I may have grabbed some off the floor after a gig. It's, it's been a long time since you and I have known each other for sure. Absolutely. Let's talk about the process of designing your stick specifically. So when you sit down with Chad to say, okay, I want the Mikey Wengren signature Vader drumstick. Talk to me about how you described what you wanted the stick to, to sound like, to feel like, to look like? Well, um, it, first of all, it was, it was an incredible honor to uh, not only be with Vader for so long, but when Chad approached me about doing a stick, it was, it was yeah, just a tremendous honor. So I, I wanted to think about what I could do so it helps my particular style of playing, but I also wanted to have some marketability behind it as well. You know, if the company was going to, um, allow me to put my name on it and their, their name is on, obviously on it. I want it to do well and, uh, and, and be useful for not just myself. So um, there were a couple different models um, of theirs that I had been switching back and forth from and, you know, evolved over the years. And I wanted to combine some of those elements uh, along with that um, to make my own stick. My style, um, I don't play a lot of fast, intricate parts it's it's more rhythmic, um, tribal, uh, syncopated, and it's meant for power and precision. Um, also, projection as well, live. So um, I wanted a stick that was a little longer um, and had a beefier shoulder. Um, um, trying Wait, to think the, of all the, the shoulder is the part of the stick that's under the tip, right, Chad? Am I am I understanding yeah. the language right? Okay. Yep, going from like the middle of the stick up towards the, the tip end there, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, a quicker taper as well. Uh, also See, helping now we're getting nerdy. We're getting I know, nerdy. but I love it though, because now <laughs> we're talking about a very specific stick design now, which is very cool. 
Absolutely. I also wanted to make sure I, I retained, uh, I, I like having the nylon tips myself. So specifically when I play like ride patterns or hat patterns, um, you hear um, more of the click sound, more of the attack. Um, for me personally, sometimes um, when I use a wood tip, the it's, it's great and it's nice and warm, but uh, in the loud style of music, the hard rock style that we play, uh, I think sometimes that that can get lost. So um, that's one of the reasons I chose the nylon tip. How important was having your drums at home with you? We were just right before you came on talking about the effect of COVID on like the drumming industry and the live mu- music industry. Just as a person, as a drummer, not the drummer of Disturbed, but how important was it for you to have that outlet at home while everything shut down? Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's a, a really excellent point. As um, things in society were were deemed essential or non-essential, for me, having access to my live kid at home couldn't, couldn't have been more essential. You know, we were planning on going out and doing a 20 uh, year anniversary of our first record. And, uh, you know, that got scrapped basically because, you know, the touring industry as we knew it, along with so many other things, just got completely shut down. So uh, it was nice to be able to keep my sanity and keep my chops up and, um, and keep, keep jamming away while, while uh, we kind of waited for this thing to figure itself out. You were probably breaking a lot less sticks too because you were just playing at home and not in front of sold out arenas. That, that's actually, that's pretty accurate. I'm, pretty, I'm sure Chad was happy about that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> we were talking about um, how hard players hit, especially when you're playing live, because the adrenaline for you has just got to be crazy. How many sticks are you going through in a show? And do you always insist on starting a show with a fresh pair of sticks? I, yeah, yeah, I actually do. I, I start off the show with a fresh pair of sticks. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hit or miss. Uh, I, I go through, you know, a few pair. I would say, you know, on an average uh, hour, hour and a half show, you know, I'm going through two, three pairs-ish. Um, and I usually like take the broken ones or the ones that are a bit shredded and I toss them out to the crowd afterwards. Yeah, we were talking about, you know, what it's like for the guys at Vader to watch all their hard work get thrown out into the crowd at the end of the night when you guys go to thank everybody for coming. The cost of doing business, the cost of marketing. (laughs) Um, All that time, all that care, nice, pretty, perfect sticks, and they get tossed out. I know. (laughs) Yeah, but they're collector's items now, right? See? Absolutely. Definitely. Check out eBay. How yeah. far can you throw a stick in, in an arena, Mike? Because we were oh. talking about who can who can throw them the furthest. Have have you tried to see, you know, how far in an arena you can actually get that thing to go? You know, you know, you could probably get them launched all the way to the the back. You know, especially you know these sticks got some weight to them, so they'll probably make it the distance. My concern is it's going to poke somebody's eye out, and then I got a lawsuit on my hands. Right. Both both me and Vader are getting sued here. So <laughs> uh, so I just generally what I like to do honestly is throughout the show, um, from where my point of view is, I like to see people in the crowd and people that are like really getting into it the most. You know, being really passionate, singing. Um, and I try to like pick them out. And so uh, when it comes time to, you know, hand out those sticks, I try to give it to the people, you know, who have been more engaged with the show or, you know, especially like if there's little kids out front, then I just walk over and hand it to the little kids. Well, those little that's kids. That's always a super cool thing to see, you know, like, yeah. especially little kids, like they just beam after that, you know, like getting handed a, a pair of sticks like that at the end of the show from, from the guy you know, that they just favorite. watched play. Yeah, exactly. It's awesome. It's totally cool to see every time. And it's it's super fun for me too. You know, I'm, I'm a dad, I got two kids and uh, any chance you can get to see those, the, the kids light up like that. Love to do it. When you were that kid, who were the drummers that you idolized? The drummers that when you were listening to the records kind of blocked out the guitars and the singing and just listened to the drummers. Like who were the most influential drummers for you that inspired you to either A, start playing the drums in the first place or B, that you kind of were inspired by to move your playing forward? 
Well, for, I mean, for me back in the day, like, uh, I was a little bit of a late bloomer. Like I said, I didn't start really getting into playing drums until I was a teenager. So that was the eighties for me, full on eighties. I was into the, the hair metal was, was big. And, uh, Tommy Lee, I mean, I mean, who else was, was the guy back in the day? I had posters of him, uh, all over the room and, you know, pretty much just wanted to be the guy. And, uh, so yeah, it was, it was all about Tommy Lee. And, uh, and then as I got a little bit older and started to uh, get into a uh, heavier music, um, and the nineties came around, it was all Vinny, Vinny Paul, Pantera. Hell yeah. It is funny. Um, you know, for anyone that kind of ever got exposed socially to the Abbott brothers, you know, I, I dug out recently an interview that I did with the guys in the Foo Fighters at Fenway some years back. And, and Dave Grohl was talking about how influenced he was about how he handled kind of being a rock star and being around a lot of different bands because of how Dimebag kind of greeted everyone backstage. Was that when you finally got to meet a guy like Vinny? Was was that your experience with the Abbott brothers? One thousand percent. It was such a trip in the beginning years to go from, you know, basically like being a, a, a super fan of those guys to then getting on like our first Ozfest uh, as one of the opening side stage bands. And those guys were headlining and, you know, um, back then, you, you know, you guys, we, we weren't really as a, as a lowly side stage act, we weren't supposed to be mingling necessarily with the, the main stage act. They had to kind of restrict some guys cause there's just so many bands on the tour. So you'd have a thousand people back there if you weren't careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, those guys being legends and us being nobody at the time, you just kind of expected to be like, yep, you guys keep your distance, you stay over there and whatever. But it was complete opposite. Those guys were like, hey, brother, come on, come on back and, you know, get yourself a black tooth and come on down to the dressing room and hang out whenever you guys want to. It was just like they it was so like for us it, it being new artists and trying to to grow and, and learn how it all works. They They took us under their wing and not just like in terms of partying and having a good time, but just really kind of helping mold us and, and showing us, you know, how to be, how, how to be so welcoming. That was something that we, we learned early on from those guys and we took it with us. And, uh, and that's still how we try to be with, with all the, the bands that are on, on the road with us now. Now, you know, whether it's an opening act or, or even just friends and family, like we're just trying to have a, 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 an awesome welcoming family vibe back there. David Letterman recently sent out a tweet like every person, you know, that's that's in the entertainment business and specifically the rock community at the recent passing of Taylor Hawkins. And he said that that Taylor was one of the only drummers that Anton Figg would would come out from behind his drum set when the Foos performed on Letterman's show because he wanted to watch him. Who are who are some drummers that that on all the tours that you've done over the years who are the drummers that you still, after all these years, just have to stand on the side of the stage and watch just from a playing perspective? I mean, honestly, for me, it's every single one, every drummer, every band, uh, you know, even if it's just for a song or two. I love to just watch other guys do their thing, especially, you know, with us as, as headliners these days, it's, it pumps me up. I'm like, okay. Let's see how this guy's gonna do. Let's 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 watch him throw down, and then it just gets me like, okay, your your turn now. It's my turn. Let's. I'm, I can't wait to go up and do my thing because now you inspired me. Drumming seems like something that is super habit forming because there's so much muscle memory there, right? But as a drummer, are you allowed to like borrow, <laughs> steal, um, covet? Uh, a move, uh, uh, you know, is, is there video footage of old drummers, a, a Bonham or a whoever that you've been like, oh, wait, that's how they did that and incorporated that into your playing? Because I've got to imagine that it it all inspires and feeds into the next generation of drummers, right? Yeah, I, I mean, at this point, it's all really just recycled. You know, um, it, it's not like anybody's reinventing the wheel here necessarily. You're just taking and like you said, borrowing, stealing, uh, whatever you're, you, whatever you want to call it, we're just taking it and putting our own spin on it. And, you know, if I take it from 
say drummer one, two, and three, and I switch it around and, and put my own technique, my own spin on it, then the next generation kind of looks and says like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to take Mike Wengren's thing. And it's almost like a little joke. I'm like, well, it's not, wasn't always my thing. I turned it into my thing because I took it from Vinny and I took it from Tommy, you know? So I don't know. I guess everybody just makes their own, um, their own recipe of blends of different ingredients known as the other drummers. You talk about how like the, it, which it, it hit me like a bullet, um, you know, celebrating the 20th anniversary of your first record, you know, like that's how long I've known you, which is crazy. Talk to me about the Seven. difference in your style and playing from that first record to now, because obviously as your playing evolves and the different sound that you may want to get for a new album because we know you guys are kind of working on new stuff right now and how that then translates to your relationship with Chad, because if you want your drums to sound different for the sound of a record or whatever, it goes all the way down to how Chad's got to get the guys to make your sticks. Well, I think one of the things that I love about my sticks and just Vader specifically and Chad is the, the consistency level. Um, the, from day one, it's always, I always, that's, that's why I play Vader. Cause I could count on, that's one of the things I don't have to worry about. Oh, is this pair going to, you know, hold up? Um, I'm in the middle of, you know, recording a part and this is the money take right here, but nope, stick just broke. So that's, it's like, um, I guess maybe to a certain degree, it's not something I think of on a daily basis. Maybe I take it for granted for a little bit, but, um, that's because of the level of consistency throughout the years. It's really the only stick I've ever played for my entire career, honestly. That is a really and important stick wise point. too. Yeah. Like Mike hasn't uh, ever even brought up like needing to modify his stick design or anything like that over the years, you know, it's back again to that design process and, and coming up with a, a signature stick like that. Like, you know, you want a hundred percent nail it for, you know, that player and their technique and their whole vibe and, and the whole thing. Um, cause yeah, I mean, as we evolve as drummers and get older, uh, sometimes <laughs> your needs kind of change a little bit and, uh, some people kind of fall out of shape and get a little rusty and all that kind of stuff. Then they end up needing something that's a little bit different or smaller or something like that. But, uh, yeah, Mikey's been consistently on the same, same stick design now, what, 13, 14 years or something like that since, uh, the stick model came out. Yeah, that that sounds about right. I hope you're not giving me a hint here as we're talking about getting older. I'm in the, I'm in the gym as often as I can so I can throw those sticks around. <laughs> <laughs> Consistency is a really important word too because I think, you know, any any drummer can can play and practice and prepare for a gig, a, an important show. But when when you do anything where your level of expertise has to be night after night when you're making drumsticks you could make the perfect pair of sticks once but to have to do it day in and day out over and over again and for as a drummer to be able to deliver that as close to perfect performance every night I think you both in different ways have this pressure of maintaining that high level of excellence because of the consistency that's expected. Well, Absolutely. That's, that's what makes it such a great marriage. Especially with smartphones, like you're saying, like, you know, back in the day when the first Disturbed record came out, if, if you broke a stick at like the worst time or whatever, like the only the people in the arena saw it. Now everybody's got a camera phone. And if you mess up, it's forever. <laughs> yeah. And believe me, even back in the day, there was there was a lot of late night Mike Wengren calls. <laughs> phone going off and all that and uh yeah what a ball busting well so some of those calls were related to product uh quality control and others were maybe just uh you know some silliness and debauchery uh <laughs> when we were younger i don't know what you're talking about i wasn't witness to any of that debauchery at all ever never not once um, I, I call i call bs on that carrie <laughs> <laughs> um we referenced obviously the recent passing of a drummer like Taylor Hawkins. We recently in the last couple of years have lost a guy like Neil Peart. Um, can you guys both kind of talk to me about 
who you think some of the most influential, because drumming is, and, and we referenced this earlier, Mike, before you got on, that it's a big world, but it's a very small world. So can you talk to me about, about the, the drummers? And, and Chad kind of gave me some examples of early like jazz guys that were the band leaders that were so influential. Um, I'm not going to ask you who the best drummers are because best is so subjective. But, you know, you referenced a guy like Vinny. You referenced a guy like a Tommy Lee. When you go back and look through the, the years and eras of rock and roll, are there any other drummers that, that you feel need to be in that inspirational kind of list that kind of changed the game? Ooh, there are so many. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you get your... You ones that come up all the time, Ringo, John Bonham, Keith Moon, uh, Ginger Baker, you know, those kind of guys. You get Vinnie Paul, you got Tommy Lee, um, Charlie Watts, you know, also we, we lost, lost not that recently. long ago. Exactly. Um, you know, Hal Blaine, who was, you know, part of the Wrecking Crew out in LA, who recorded so much stuff for everybody. Um, yeah, there's just there's so many guys. Um you know, Stuart Copeland and Simon Phillips and Steve Ferrone. Uh, the list really just goes on and on. Um, I don't know who else Mike can, can think of. Um, yeah, I think you, you, you're you just going down the list and name, naming all the top icons there. Um, I don't, I can't think of anybody else to add to that right now, but yeah. you know, in, in reference um, to say the, the passing of, of Taylor Hawkins, you know, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I never had the pleasure to meet him personally. I didn't know him, but you know, clearly know his work. And one of the things that always impressed me the most about him is, you know, this is the drummer for Dave Grohl, who is a amazing badass drummer himself. Uh, mm -hmm. And also iconic from going back to, to Nirvana. So to be able to, to, to be able to not just hang with that guy, but, you know, you know, just slam it every night for, for or an already iconic drummer to me spoke volumes about him and his abilities. So, um, you know, it's, it's just such a tremendous loss um, for the drumming community, um, Foo Fighter fans. Um, and it also hits home for me because we're the same exact age. Yeah, it it it's a very sobering kind of thing and and that has is something that's come up a lot in these tributes is that the pressure as a drummer to take over the kit for a drummer turned frontman. There are only a few examples. I remember back in the day having this conversation with Will Hunt when Tommy Lee transitioned mm. his career because I was like, dude, like you have to play drums in Tommy Lee's band and Tommy's standing right there. That can't be yeah. easy. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. Yeah, that's unreal. I don't even know how, you know, just being a music fan for so long and drumming fan or, and all that, how guys like that, you know, even just handle that, <laughs> you know? And like you said, like Will getting a call to, to go out and play for Tommy Lee or, you know, and then to go out and, you know, fill in for Motley when he did a couple of times, you know, for Tommy and Morgan Rose did the same thing, like, you know, you're thrown right into that, you know? It's a, yeah, it's crazy. And then going back to Taylor, like just, you know, that guy, you know, just being an amazing musician all around, you know, drums and could sing like crazy and, you know, the whole thing, great songwriter. Uh, like no matter how successful he was or, you know, where he was in his career or anything like that, like he always super enthusiastic about the music industry and drumming and, and all that, like never, like always had that, like childlike, for lack of a better word, like excitement and, and passion for it, you know, and, and to see that, you know, at that kind of a level, after all the success and fame and the whole thing is, is really something special, you know. Have you noticed that in your career, Mike, that you're, you're enjoying playing more now because of that, that gratefulness and enthusiasm that you've had this longevity of career are you more appreciative of it now than ever yeah for for me 1000 percent, i couldn't be more appreciative i think that for us um in the beginning 
you know, was single, no children. It was just for myself. We were all just doing it for ourselves and for each other and for the fans. Um, and we grinded it out. Um, we busted our asses and we just kept moving forward. It was a, a nice, slow and steady organic climb. And uh, now that we're at the top of our careers, one of the benefits of having great success is that we don't really have to do this anymore if we chose not to. So we're able to do it because we love it and we live it and we need it in our lives, not because we need to do it after all these years to pay our bills. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying it's it's a very, uh, um, it's, it's just a tremendous blessing to be able to have that choice. Um, and to me, that makes me feel even more passionate about it because now I do have kids and if I am going to be away from them, it needs to count. That time away from them has to absolutely be worth it. Um, so I just feel more motivated uh, than ever before to put out the best music we can and go out there and make it count every night. We just cited a bunch of examples of drummers that came out from behind the kid and sang. When are they going to let you sing, Mike? <laughs> okay well you know i'm the guy that has had several drinks at the end of the night and then i like to to come out with the rob halford um high harmonies um but for some reason i only seem to be able to do that when i'm intoxicated so um, no I, I i i do i do some uh, i do some backups and and whatnot uh, uh live on stage um, but I don't particularly care to be out in front of the kit. My, uh, my moment, I guess for that is when we do sound of silence and I get to walk out in front and, and uh, stand behind the timpani, but I still have the timpani sitting back there. So I have like that little buffer zone. Yeah. The first time I saw you guys do that in an arena, I was like, I bet Mikey never imagined that he was going to have to take timpanis out on the road. No, that, that was never, uh, I never saw that vision uh, <laughs> back in the beginning, but uh, it's awesome. It's I love such it. a great it's part nice of the to... show now. Oh yeah. I, I, I love it. The, when um, we try to sneak those things out there in the dark uh, with like a little segue music or something, but people see them coming out and they, they go wild for it because they know what's coming up next. And Chad, you know, they make that part of the show and all of a sudden, rather than just sending out bricks of sticks, now you've got to send him mallets for his timpani playing when he's out with the There they go. Yep, there go the mallets. Right. <laughs> yeah. Mikey's yeah, getting all I, artsy up there playing timpani. I, I've been playing those, those, those black signature sticks for, like you said, about 13 years now, and I can't imagine Chad's face when, when my tech call him up and says, yeah, we need you to send us a... Uh, uh, a brick of uh, of uh, uh, mallets. Wait, he's like, wait, what? Yes, uh, uh, huh? For when? Are you Frankel. serious? <laughs> <laughs> and I bet you break them a lot less. Yeah. Yes. Most definitely. I don't think I've ever broken one yet. <laughs> <laughs> a little more delicate of an instrument, for sure. Yeah. Timpani. There's a little more finesse required in that one. A little more dynamic. Before yeah. I before I let you go, um, I'm gonna get raked over the coals if I don't ask you this question, Mike. What are you guys, what, what's going on with Disturbed right now? Where, where are you guys at with this new music? Because if I don't ask you that question, I'm going to hear about it. So what, what's the gossip? What can you tell me? Because you know I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> um, well, you know, I can't divulge too many details just yet. Um, but we're definitely in the middle of the process. We have been writing. We have been recording. Um, very excited about um, everything that we're coming up with right now. It's feeling great. It's sounding great. We don't necessarily have a definitive uh, time frame right now. Um, coming off two years of a pandemic, we just have been taking our time and trying to put out the, uh, the best record of our careers um, and top everything that we've ever done before. So, um, yeah, we're, we're not going anyway any, anytime soon. Um, I, think, I think people are going to be pleasantly surprised when they finally get a chance to hear this. And it's something that we've all learned in our respective parts of the same industry um, that, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like over the last couple of years since the pandemic and the years before that with, with as crazy as the world has gotten, I feel like the rock community 
is kind of setting itself up as the example of inclusion. That we're all of a sudden the freaks, the weirdos that we all are, that we are now showing what it's like to have a community of people that are so different, so varied, you know, young, old, uh, male, female, religious, not that you got people out there with their faces painted and guys that are bankers that are just there to enjoy the show on the weekend, that the rock community is this real example of kind of something the rest of the world should kind of figure out. Because when we all go to those shows, we're all there for the same reason. And that camaraderie and and brotherhood that is there for us, that family is something that maybe the rest of the world should kind of figure out because we seem to have gotten it figured out pretty good. Well, we're just, we're just here trying to do our part, trying to continue that example. And I, I completely agree with you. I, I, uh, I think the rock community is, is, completely welcoming it's it's for everyone um you don't just have to be a, a metalhead you don't have to live it you can um come in at any time what what i love about the music and especially coming to see the the live concerts which i can't wait to get back out there and start I doing bet. that uh, this year is um it's it's a release not just for us uh on stage when we're playing but for everyone all the insanity of the world that is happening right now put that leave, leave that at the door leave that in the parking lot you're you know what well, everyone is so divided these days it seems and this is a chance for us to come together as one um we all have things we deal with on a day-to-day basis leave that at the door come inside and just let it out Re- enjoy the release um let's be a family and just have a great time I can't wait to be able to do that with you guys again in person. I I love that I get to talk to you guys in this way, but I can't wait for us to be at a show um, listening to Mikey sing Judas Priest songs. I can't I can't wait for that again. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> ready for it. Bring it. And it's always great that uh, those guys always book some uh, a couple of days off around Boston too. So it's shocking it's, how uh, that always seems you know? to happen, isn't it, Chad? Uh, yeah. What a coincidence. Every time. <laughs> it's it's like they like having the mass holes around. We're good comic relief. <laughs> well, in, in, in the beginning, I, I think that started because we needed the time off for to recover uh, <laughs> from, uh, from the hang out the, from the hangovers. But uh, now there's uh, there's wonderful people like you two jackasses that I love to see <laughs> and, and hug and uh, and have a great time with. And I, and I miss you guys and I love you and I can't wait to see you guys again. Thank you guys both so much for taking so much time to talk to me today. I think it's a really fascinating thing for music fans to be able to see kind of this relationship between drummer and and drumstick manufacturer and kind of get those questions answered. So I'm so grateful for all your time today. Thanks, guys. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks for having me. All right. I'll see you guys soon. Go put your pants on, Mikey. Yeah, go put your pants on. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of comfortable sitting here with uh, with it hanging in the breeze. I don't think <laughs> I don't have to get the kids for a little bit here, so I might just walk around and and let it flop. <laughs> that's how we're ending the show. And there we go. Scene. Yep, that's how you end the show. There they are: Chad Brandolini from Vader Percussion and Mike Wengren, the drummer from Disturbed. If you're looking for more information about Vader or you want to find Disturbed online, click the links in the show notes of this podcast. It's also where you'll find the link to the corresponding playlist, which is filled with music and artists that were referenced in this interview. I make them for every full-length episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to click follow and subscribe to the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes come out every Wednesday. Plus, you never know when we're going to get a bonus episode, like this week when I sat down with Dave the Snake Sabo from Skid Row. Whenever I have a guest on my video show, Cocktails in the War Room, you always get the audio from that posted as an after-action report. You can watch the show live on my Facebook page every Tuesday night at 8.30 Eastern. And if you subscribe and follow the Mistress Carrie podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, you also get the sit rep. Every Monday through Friday, you get the Situation Report, which is all your rock news, music headlines, and industry info in less than five minutes. 
You'll find the information to all of that and more at mistresscarry.com. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network.